Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. What is the good life? What is the good life? Gurus from the beginning of time have tried to answer the question, what is the good life? Every influencer on YouTube is trying to tell us what is the good life. Every leadership expert, every management guru, every person who's ever wanted to influence another group of people has tried to tell us what the good life is. And that's exactly what Jesus opens up his his message, the most important message ever spoken in history. Here is the Son of God who's come to this earth to introduce us to a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that we cannot see, the kingdom of the sky, which is beyond what we can understand. It is not earthly wisdom. It is wisdom from beyond the clouds that is greater than anything we could know. Jesus comes, he, he breaks through and he says, I can tell you what the good life is and I can tell you who it's for. Those are the two questions we want to know. We don't want to just know if, it's, if there is a good life. We want to know if we can have it. Is the good life good for me as well? And Jesus opens up the introduction to his uh, Sermon on the Mount is, yes, I'll explain to you what the good life is, and I'll also tell you who it is for. Now, remind yourselves, he is opening this sermon up on this, on, and the, and the, what I like to call the armpit of the Roman Empire. The Romans were the most powerful uh, group in that time. The Roman people, which were miles away, didn't care anything about Israel. And then Jesus starts his ministry preaching about the kingdom in the northern part of Israel, which was even the forgotten part of Israel. Israel is of no consequence to Rome, and the northern part of Israel is no consequence to Israel. And so there he is in the hills of the Galilee that Jesus begins to talk about what the kingdom of God is. Now, as I preach it, I want to remind you that I, I believe this was one talk. It may have been taught in different places. It may have been broken up into different sections. But I don't believe you can understand the Sermon on the Mount without taking the whole sermon into account. One of the, the things I like to point out the most is the people who get the angriest about divorce, and they'll say, see what Jesus said about divorce? I just want to remind people, the verse before that, he said, if you struggle with temptation, cut your hand off. So if you're going to yell at divorce people, how about I don't want you to see you pointing anybody. All right? If I'm going to take that literally, then I'm going to gouge my eyes out because I promise I'm looking at things. I mean, I've seen things I ought not be looking at, you know? So I had to gouge those out. I believe it might be hyperbole. <laughs> and if you and if you teach English, it's hyperbole. But anyway, all right, I got your attention. Fantastic. All right. The opening address cannot be overstated. The opening part of a speech is, is what gets your attention, is what snatches, their, what gets them to lean in. And that's what Jesus is using here. Jesus is standing at the height of his popularity. He's not just starting his ministry. He's got great crowds following him because of the miracles. At the height of his popularity, he reveals the kingdom. A kingdom of the heart, a spiritual kingdom. A kingdom that is about being and not doing this is so big for us, y'all, because every time we can get passionate about what God is looking for us, we can start attempting to achieve what he wants from us. But I want you to understand, you do not have a God who is waiting for you to get in line. You have a God who wants you to live what he gives you. Receive the kingdom and live the kingdom. This is not about attributes to attain. These are not characteristics to work out. This is about what the kingdom will look like when it is in your life. You should be thankful. He's not a God up there waiting for you to tisk tisk and get to these points and all that kind of stuff. He's a God that says, let me reveal in you the kingdom that I've already put in your heart. Let it come forth. And this is what it'll look like is what he says. It's a spiritual world. Being not doing, it's inward joy. I love that little mini sermon Pastor Kevin gave a few minutes ago about inward joy. That's what it's all about. I wish we would all be people who would live this life with complete inward joy. There was a time in my life that I thought living the God life was the place of least joy. I don't know why. No one ever said this to me, but I got the feeling that God just liked me to be miserable. He was only happy when I was miserable. He was only happy. He was only pleased when I was least pleased. 
And somewhere along the line, I'm so thankful my theology got figured out. Everything that exists in this world is for our pleasure. Our joy, God, but God must be the ultimate joy, not the pleasure, not the power, not the control, not the fame, not the money. God will give people money who, are, who find their joy in him, but, but if you find joy in money, I, I deputize God to take it away from you. If you find joy in being known, I ask God on, on all of us, Lord, don't let us lose sight of the kingdom because there's so many things on this earth we like having sight of. If you don't amen at this part, um, okay. Just kidding. Jesus gives us his master class. This is the master, the master's class. What is the good life and who is it for? Now, one more caveat before I actually dive into what we're talking about, because I got a lot to go through today. Because the Beatitudes are so thick. And they're so complicated. No, no, they're not complicated. They're very simple. We complicate the mess out of simple stuff. And so today, I'm going to give you five different views of how to complicate it so much you won't understand anything I say today. That's what good teachers do. Te I thought teachers gave information. That's what I thought teaching was about. When I, when I became a teacher here at the school, it was about getting all the information out and somehow getting them to understand the information that was going to be on a test later. So it was all about information transfer. But teaching throughout history and what teaching is at its core is, is very little about information and much more about transformation. The point of teaching is to change your life. We want people to remember something, but God wants to change our life. That's what teaching is. And so I, I just want you to understand, I don't, some of us have had moments where a, a light bulb comes on for us and it could change our entire life by understanding what that is. is any, now I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you a couple of events that changed your life forever that it didn't take information to change, okay? Can anybody in this house remember where you were when you heard that Kennedy was shot? Good. All right, go ahead and tell on yourself. Great. All right, so just so you know, that was like over 60, it was 60 years ago. So, I mean, it was a long time ago. But you remember. Okay, all right. You remember. Okay. All right, it changed your life. How many, okay, how many of you remember when the Challenger exploded? You remember that? It was a pretty defining moment for you, yeah? This past week, I hope we haven't forgotten. But this past week, we remembered 9-11, can you remember where you were on September 11th, 2001? I was in that church building on the second floor and they brought us downstairs promptly into the sanctuary. It was the only time I watched TV in that building my entire life. Somehow, Howerton rigged up a TV so that we could watch the second building fall. I remember on the back row of the red pews, that me and R.T. Johnson and there was a couple other guys that vowed we would go into the army and go back and get these guys. I was 15 years old and I vowed to be in the army. I signed up for the Lord's army. And um, so I broke my vow to R.T., but we're still, we're still okay. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget where I was. Now, this one is so recent, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you live for another couple of decades, I promise you, you will not forget COVID. It changed the world. It changed everything. For some of you, it's changed your biology. Some of you are now dealing with something that either came through a tube or through that virus that you, it may never leave your body. Things have changed. It changed our nation. Things are different. Those of us who want to go back beyond four years ago, we want to go back for more reasons than just the political issues. Life changed. I will tell you this. It wasn't but 150 years ago that the theory of, of germs even came up. 150 years ago, a guy said, hey, there's things that we can't see that could make you sick. And now... Just in the last few years, there was a bottle of arsenic outside of every, every everywhere you went. You, you know, cyanide yourself constantly because we believed his germ theory that if anything touched, 
we couldn't see COVID. Now, follow the science, right? So a virus that we couldn't see changed everything forever. What about a God or a kingdom that we cannot see that could change everything forever? This is the kingdom of heaven. You cannot see it. That's the point. But if you could understand what he's offering to us, it could transform your life forever. So I want to tell you real quick before we get into the Beatitudes, I want to tell you how to read the Beatitudes. And I'm going to give you a bunch of different ways you can read it. And then I'm going to tell you the way I don't want you to read it. Okay? Now, this part, this part right here is not Bible. This is web. Okay? So I'm going to tell you how web reads it. And, and I'm going to offer it to you. You can choose however you want. And I'm also going to tell you how Webb does not read it. And I would like you to listen to me. But if you want to read it that way, that's fine. But this is not Bible. This is just my understanding. And I've studied a lot of different points of view. A lot of different points of view. I really wanted this to be important to all of us. So I studied my, 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 my week out. So here we go. All right. When you read the Beatitudes, I want you, number one, I want you to read them presently, in the present tense. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not eventually. Kingdom of heaven now. Those who are poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is yours today. It is not eventually. Blessed are the, the, the um, all these other ones. <laughs> it's in the Bible. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We, we read it in the English tense. They shall means future. In, when you read shall in the Bible, you should understand shall means will. They are comforted. Okay? Those who are mourning will be comforted. They are comforted. Those who are meek inherit the earth. Not eventually. Not the next earth. This earth. I want you to understand, all of us want to follow meek people. None of us like to follow arrogant people. Nobody likes to follow a prideful person. I'm going to give you an illustration that only six of us are going to get, but I said it at Wednesday night and it worked out really well. But football, I love football so much, and I, I love in the offseason watching when a quarterback like Tom Brady will decide to lower his contract he will go in and, and renegotiate his contract to get lower money so that they can hire better players so they can win the championship next year. Now, I'm just going to tell you, when he does that, that team will give their life for that man. And then they go win a championship because they were able to get better talent because he reneg renegotiated down. Now, that's what you want. You don't want someone who is out to get everything they can get. You want someone who says, I deserve this, but I'm going to hand it. Listen, have you ever been in a circumstance? Some, many of you in this room have, but have you ever been in a circumstance where the, the company was going down, finances were tight, and the leader stood up and said, listen, I'm cutting my check for, I mean, I'm, I'm lower, I'm taking my check out for, you guys are going to get paid before I do. Amanda's uh, grandmother started a, uh, uh, a health center in Marana years ago, and it got to the place where finances got so tight, and she told everyone there, I will cut your check as soon as the money comes in, and I'll cut my check last. Those people gave their life for that woman. Anybody who's willing to say that, that I'm going to put your needs ahead of my own, that's a real leader. Those are the people who inherit the earth today. We think if I don't get mine, I ain't going to get it at all. That's not the truth. The more you are humble, the more you give to others, the more you receive in the long. So you get it. Okay, so that's the, just the first one. All right, I got to go. Here we go. Here's another thing I want you to know is that they build on each other. When you're reading them, they're not separate ideas. They build on each other. They, they extend, they get stronger, and I'll explain deeper in just a minute. I want you to read them together. Again, they're not separate ideas. He's not being like, oh, yeah, and this one's blessed. Oh, yeah, and these people are blessed. These is, this is a unit. He's trying to build it up. I want you to read it backwards. Okay, this is an interesting way to do it. So because of the kingdom of heaven, blessed are the poor in spirit. Can you hear it like that? Because of the kingdom of heaven... Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. That's a way to read it as well. That's a blessing to understand it. Because of the payoff, even those of you who are in the bad column can be blessed because there's a payoff to it. That's another way to read it. I like to read, the, read it backwards. Because, um, 
Because you will be satisfied, you can hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do you understand? What, do you get what I'm saying? Reading it backwards. Okay. Uh, reading it, uh, the, the Jesus, Jesus models each of these. Every one of these characteristics he wants for us to exemplify, and he models them for us. And I'll explain that in a minute. This is my favorite one. So I told you not to read eventually, right? It's a present tense. But I want you to read the word even in there. I want you to read this word. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they even will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Not only, they, they, will, they even, those who are religiously bankrupt, those who are spiritually empty will inherit the kingdom of heaven. I want you to read the word even in there. Like, that's the beauty of it. It's like even the worst, those who have nothing to offer are the ones who get to in, in, bring it in. And I want you also to read them as illustrations or explanations. These are not commands. These are not achievement points. These are not checkpoints to get to. These are illustrations and explanations of what those who are in the kingdom look like. Now, don't read it this way. Do not read it as actions to attain. Do not read them as separate ideas and don't read them as commands. All right. Are you ready? Because I'm still not. Still an introduction here. Here we go. I want you to understand where Jesus gets this idea of blessed are the from. Psalms chapter 1 verse 1 opens up like this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. The very first psalm, which every Jewish person would have known, opens up with blessed is the. So he's using colloquial language, they understand, but he's doing it in the positive. Blessed are those who have negative lives, for they get great things. That's where he starts his whole message. I also want to jump real quick. I, I, I was studying last night, and this one just jumped out. I didn't even see this in all my studies. But Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 says, The Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has set, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Now, if you remember in Luke chapter 4, I believe it is, he basically states this scripture in his hometown is what makes them mad and they walk him out. I have come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all those who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion... Uh, to give them beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit or poor in spirit. They may be called oaks of lives in you. You glorify God and uh, he glorifies you when you live this life. Uh, these are the norms of the kingdom. All right, you ready? Here we go. Beatitudes. If you got your Bibles, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 3. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. We know that Jesus has opened up his mouth to teach and this is the first place he begins. Because of Jesus... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, Jesus' account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Because of the kingdom of heaven, blessed are you if you're poor in spirit. Because you will be comforted by God, blessed are you, those who mourn. Because you shall inherit the earth, blessed are you if you are meek. 
Because you will be satisfied, blessed are you if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because you will receive mercy, blessed are you who give mercy. Because you shall see God, blessed are the pure in heart. Because you'll be called sons of God, blessed are the peacemakers. Because of the kingdom of heaven, blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Rejoice and be glad when you are persecuted. The only real response to persecution is rejoicing. Well, that seems weird. To respond to perse godly persecution with joy is not only what's told to us by Jesus, it's also told to us by James. James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you go through all kinds of, of, of tribulations in your life. We are to be people who find joy and gratitude and thankfulness in the midst of our trials because that means that God found us worthy to receive his, the persecution in this world. Now, I just think that's so cool. You remember that in Acts, right? The guys get beaten in Acts, and they run all the way back yelping. They're probably like wiping blood off their face, and they're running all the way back, and they're, they're skipping. Yay, we were found worthy to be persecuted along with God. Like, what a rejoicing moment that is. Wouldn't it have been great if Job could have gotten an ounce of that? That book would have been four chapters, and yet we had to listen to him whine for 30 of them. Wham, wham, wham. This is the worst thing ever. I'm, just, I'm more just than God is. Wham, wham, wham. I'm better than God. God ain't never held me. No, he never done. God shows up and he's like, you know what? You're right. I'm fine. It's not that big of a deal. I'm sorry. So we're told by Jesus this time that when you're persecuted for my sake, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Be joyful in the midst of your trial. Being poor in spirit the best way I can tell you what that means. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to explain what these terms mean as far as what I could understand looking at the Greek words and, and studying more commentaries than y'all even need to know exist. I've been trying really hard to figure out, but I wanted to be able to tell you today what it really means at the core of what it is. So being poor in spirit is someone who's willing to say, I need help. It's the person who's got nothing else to offer. It's the person that if you needed spiritual advice, you would not go to that person. And Jesus is saying to that person, blessed are you for the kingdom of heaven is yours. If you're ignorant of the kingdom, if you're empty of your spiritual understanding, I want you to know the kingdom of God is yours also. Today, if you're in this room and you say, Pastor, I've got nothing to offer. I don't even know why I'm here. I ain't like you people. You people are special people. I'm just, I'm just barely making it in this door each week. I want you to know the kingdom of heaven is for you. The kingdom of heaven even is even for you. Or maybe the kingdom of heaven is especially for you. If you feel like you've got nothing to offer, I want you to know today that Jesus says, great, because I've got it all. If you'll just receive it, I can give you everything you need. It's so annoying when somebody thinks they have something to offer. Those are the ones it's hard for God to use. But God loves someone who realizes two things. Number one, I need God and I need others. Do you know that, our, that Jesus showed us to do that. We, some of us in this room, we think, I don't need anybody else. I've got every, me and Jesus is all I need. We, we love sermons like that. Those are usually preached in very small churches. We love churches like that. We love sermons like that. Because I just want you to know, Jesus never said that. Jesus never, never said that I'm all you need. In fact, he said, don't, you know, like, don't forsake the church. Be around people. Jesus modeled it for us. If you don't believe me, remember the night before he was betrayed, the night he was betrayed, actually. Remember what he did? He said, I, I got to go out in here and pray. What did he say? Will you pray with me? Now, the Son of God is asking for someone else to pray for him. Who are we praying to? Jesus, the Son of God, says to his friends, I need you to pray for me. And then he was disappointed when they didn't do it, right? I mean, he's the Son of God. What's the big deal? What if I take a nap? And he comes back and he's like, guys, one hour. Do you understand my time is over? I just wanted one hour for you to pray for me. If Jesus is that upset about somebody not coming through for him, is it not probable that he understood that he needed them? 
if he exemplified poor in spirit enough, if he exemplified that, then how much more should we? How dare us not have the same heart of Jesus to say, I need help? So today, I encourage every one of you today, if you have a spirit of haughtiness, pray for humility. Now, Webb, didn't you just say we're not supposed to be these? Yes. So ask it a different way. God, give me a greater revelation of your kingdom so that I can realize how little I have to offer. Show me your glory so I can realize the only glory in my life is what you've given me. Help me to see your kingdom come and your will be done in my life. Help me understand that just as you were when you walked on this earth, I am so poor in spirit. It doesn't mean you're pathetic. It doesn't mean you're, you're, you're invaluable. I mean, you're, you're low value. You're extremely valuable because that's what he's getting ready to work us up to. But we ha- everyone starts at the same place. How many of you in this room can remember the night you gave your life to the Lord for real? Were there tears in your eyes? Was there, a, was there a broken heart? Do you ever wonder now that it's been years ago, do you ever wonder to yourself, what's wrong with me that I don't have the same tears? Do you ever wonder, am I calloused? Am I, is there something wrong in my spirit that I don't weep like I used to weep? Because that's what happens next. Those who are poor in spirit will be people who mourn. Oh, do you grieve for souls? Do you have people in your life that when you look at there, you know they're going towards hell and you say to yourself, I can't live another day. God, please get your hands on them. Do you mourn for souls? Do you, do you weep for the own sinfulness in your own heart? Are you broken by the kingdom of God that would bring conviction and blessings in your life? Do you, do you, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Can I just, my Uncle Raymond, I'm just, I, I love that my Uncle Raymond sits over here. He's such a blessing to me. I, I love him. I love him to death. But he explained something to me just a few years ago that I had thought my whole life I wanted to know what it meant. And he he explained it so simply. I've heard people say all the time, you need to pray through. And anytime they say pray through, all they mean is pray longer, which is not what I wanted to hear. (laughs) When I asked the question, I wanted to be like, I'm done, right? Like, pray through what? The prayer? Like, what am I praying through? And he told me, you pray through to joy. I don't know if you remember telling me that, but that's what, it was like you travail in that altar until your heart is no longer burdened. You should be burdened in the altar, but you pray until the burden is lifted and you find joy. It's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. And that's what praying through is. When you come into the presence of God, you should weep. You should be broken. You should be contrite. But it's in the midst of that prayer that you pray through unto joy, and then you can get up and take that joy into the strength that you need and everything else you do. that's what praying through was. I thought it was an hour. I thought it was a time period. I thought eventually like I would be like, you know what, God, we're done here. There's never a time you're done with God. But pray through to joy. Pray through until you have been comforted for those things that you have mourned. Where God says to you, now, you have, you have seen it. You know what the problems are. You know what you want to fix. I'm going to motivate you to get those things. Now it's time to get up comfort the word comfort in the bible means to give power to it doesn't mean oh that's so nice we always think it means like a pillow it's not a pillow it's giving power to and we go back to nehemiah the joy of the lord is our strength that's what it means you pray you be broken you feel so weak you can't hardly get up god i don't know how i'm going to do this and in the midst of that when you pray through all of a sudden it's like eating a mushroom and you're mario you know you're ready to go take on the world That's what it means to pray through. Blessed are you who mourn. If you're in this room and you say, man, I can't even get in the presence of God without crying, don't don't hurt yourself. That's where you're supposed to be. The kingdom of God breaks your heart. Brokenness is an essential part of the spirit. I'm not even looking at my notes, y'all. I might have to preach it again next week. But after being poor in spirit and realizing how bankrupt you are and you've got nothing to offer God, then your heart can be convicted of all the trials that you have brought into your own life by your own sinfulness and how God is constantly trying to to bless you and bring you out of it. And that will lead you into being meek. To not feel like you've got to flex your muscles when every time you've got the muscles to flex. Ain't that the worst look people have? Don't you know that person who can't not say the snarky comment? 
I, I love it when someone says, I'm just saying what everybody else is thinking. Well, they thinking it. They're smart enough not to say it, dummy. <laughs> you think you're so smart because you're saying what everybody else is. Everybody else is smart enough not to say it. How many of us live our life this way? How many people do you know that literally every, they spend every single dollar on themselves? They, they waste every single minute on themselves. Every opportunity is for themselves. Every thought that pass, passes through their mind it comes out their mouth. There's no substance to these people. There's nothing extra. There's no mystery. But to those who are meek, those people who are willing to stand by and be close and let their presence be felt but not have to take over things. That's huge. If you're in this room and you, you, you struggle with control, pray for meekness. Webb, didn't you say not to? No, I'm saying let the kingdom of God work in you meekness. You've been given dominion in this life. The only dominion you want is over others. You've not been given that. If you want to have dominion, plant a garden. You've been given dominion over that. If you want to have dominion, shoot a deer. You've been given dominion over that. Clean your house. There are things you have dominion over, but most of the time we only want dominion over the things that we got no business having on our lives. You want to inherit the earth? Be meek. The next one is hungering and thirsting after righteousness. This is something we don't understand in our English language because we don't understand Greek, but hunger and thirst is very clear. I hunger and thirst right now. I would love... A Totino's pizza and a regular Coca-Cola right now. That would be fantastic. I hunger and thirst. Now, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Okay, so that's different. I crave to see things done right. The word satisfied at the end of that, <laughs> it does not give it. The word means fed. Those who hunger and thirst will be fed. Hunger and thirst for what? Those, what does it mean to hunger and thirst? after righteousness it means perfectionists those who crave things to be exactly right and nothing is ever exactly right those who can't get happy with mundane or little things people who are so perfectionist minded is frustrating because other people apparently just don't care about things like I care about them it doesn't bother other people apparently to do things badly to hunger and thirst after righteousness is to be those kinds of people that want things right, and when they're not right, they can't stand it. And Jesus says to them, you'll be satisfied. And these are the least satisfied people on earth. Don't save it. Do y'all do don't know any perfectionists? I was raised by a perfectionist, okay? Now, my dad... Everything the man touches turns to gold, but it's because he makes it turn into gold. He's unhappy until it's pure gold. Do you understand? People who are perfectionists, they have to bend reality into what is right. And God says to them, those of you who are just not quite satisfied with what you have, there is satisfaction in the kingdom of God. All that striving can go away. Now, that, I was talking about personality there, okay? I, I'm not trying to get you confused here. Did Jesus hunger and thirst for righteousness? Did he crave righteousness? See how he talks to the, uh, the Pharisees. <laughs> he's going to say in a few verses from now, he's going to say, hey, unless your righteousness is better than these jokers, you got nothing. Jesus craved rightness. Right action, right motive, right thinking, doing the right thing at the right time. And Jesus lived a satisfied life. If you're in this room today and you're, you're part of what I'm talking about, you're that perfectionist crew that nothing is ever just exactly right, I want you to know today, you can be fed. You can be filled. You can be satisfied. That's what the kingdom offers you today. You could be fattened is actually what the word means. I like it. 
you always feel like there ain't enough, that not, not enough thought has been put into it. I just want you to know you can be fattened. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Because you will receive mercy, you can be merciful. Because you have received mercy, you can be merciful. I just want you to know today, you may feel like I've been burned too many times. I want you to know there's a mercy that may not come from the place you're having to grant so much mercy, but there's a mercy that's offered to you. Jesus can have mercy on you. And trust me, whatever somebody has done against you, you have done far worse to God. You can be merciful again. Receive it and give it. Help those who cannot help you back. Blessed are the pure in heart. The word pure, in, the phrase pure in heart doesn't mean what we think. We think like Disney Cinderella, like, oh, the pure in heart. That's not what it meant in the Greek, in the Greek term. It wasn't pure purity of like, oh, she's selfless. It meant singleness of mind. When Jesus said this, what he knew what he meant. He meant that it was somebody who there's no guile in. There's no turning left and right. It's people who are focused people, those driven people. They're pure in heart. There's, there's nothing that's separating them. We think it means like they're, they're so saved. But let me just tell you, the pure, if you want to be pure, if you want to see God and you want to be a person pure in heart, the only way for you to be... I got to take time to unpack this. Listen, we think that there's a way for us to get righteous enough that God will bless us with all these things. But I just want you to know your righteousness, no matter how good it gets, still needs bleach, filthy rags, stanky rags. So you sit here around and you're like, oh, I messed up again. Doggone. I guess I got to start all over tomorrow. No, no, no. What do we do? If you want to be clean in this world, I want you to know it's not going to come from your effort. It's going to come from you saying to Jesus again, cleanse me, give me a, we love that scripture. Uh, We used to sing songs about it. Give me clean hands, give me a pure heart. We read that and we're like, yes, God, give me a pure heart that stays pure. That's what we think, like magically. The only way your heart gets pure is for you to cleanse it. Oh, come on, guys. Can you hear it? You can't stay clean in this world. You've got to cleanse it. And how do we cleanse it? We go back to the cleaner and we say, God, cleanse me again. And what is cleansing? Repentance. I failed again. I failed again. I've got nothing to offer you. I can't stay clean for 30 minutes. Do you ever have that situation as a kid? I don't have this patience with my own sons. I'm just having this picture right now in my head. Did you ever that moment where you, you failed something for the 30th time and you didn't want to get caught so you're trying to feverishly fix it and the parent perhaps you're most afraid of catches you in the midst of trying to fix it and they kneel down with you in that moment and they say, oh, it's okay, baby. We'll take care of it together this time. Man, that action of grace. I know you tried, baby. I know you tried so hard. I hate it when my kids look scared at me. I'm so sorry, Daddy. I'm so sorry. I'll do better. Buddy, don't be afraid of me. I, I'm trying to make you better. I am, but I'm, I'm, I'm with you. That's what Jesus did. We're getting ready to go to the next one, which is just going to blow your mind when you understand what this means. <laughs> But the ones who have the purity of heart, the single-mindedness to understand that people matter more than stuff, that kneels down and says, I'm going to help you in this moment. They're the peacemakers. When I think of a peacemaker, I think of someone who's just peaceful. Blessed are, it's not blessed are the peaceful. It's blessful, blessed are the peacemakers. And I just want you to know, peacemakers get bruised. Peacemakers are the ones who get phone calls to go to the, to the house where guns have already been pulled. Peacemakers are the ones who run to the houses where the fires are ravaging everybody's belongings. Peacemakers are the people who run into the middle of the fight 
We don't even know what that is. We used to have a day when there was debate going on. There was actual mediators who the whole purpose of a mediator is to keep peaceful and they weren't trying to contradict each other and get them pinned against each other. We don't even know what that means anymore. But there are people in the world who are mediators who literally live their life getting in between. And here's the thing. Have you ever noticed something? Somebody will come to you and complain about their spouse. Come on, just raise your hand. If anybody's ever had somebody else complain about their spouse, be honest, come on. All right. Now, have you ever helped them, listened, and then tried to help them? Ever had that happen? Have, if you do that more than one time, they're going to hate you when they get back in love with their spouse. I tell, I tell uh, when we have premarital counseling, I'll say, don't ever tell your single friends about your married problems because single folks can't understand it. It's not they're not evil, they're not mean, they just... They don't have a paradigm for it. They certainly can understand that this monster that you felt about was today and you're going to spend the rest of your life with this monster. They can't, it doesn't compute. Love is, makes you blind. And if you give voice to every thought in your head, you're going to look really dumb. Some people who can't understand it. But I promise you this, if you see conflict between two people, it says, blessed are those who enter that conflict and try to, to make amends. But often the peacemaker is the one that gets swung and hit in the face. How many referees have, have walked out of the ring bloody? Do you know that's what Jesus did for you? We're the kid on the floor. We've busted the thing. We're trying to clean everything up. We're, we're raking it as best we can. We're trying to do it quietly so nobody sees us. Jesus comes and lays his hand on our back. And he says, hey, I'm going to help you deal with this. And the way he does it is he leaves the room bloody. Jesus took on all of our issues. He took the, the spanking we deserved because he's a peacemaker. He reconciled us back. When we do that, we're called sons of God. By who? Probably not the people you entered the issue with, but maybe by God himself. <sighs> what if we stopped caring about the result in this earth and we only cared about the viewpoint of heaven? That when God looks down at you, he says, that's my kids. Those are my... Every time they see conflict, they run toward it, not away from it. They're people who know how to bring people together and reconcile and love on them and show them what they need most. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Let me just tell you right now, if you are a peacemaker, a peacemaker, if you're a pizza maker, there's going to be a different blessing for you. But if you're a peacemaker, there will be persecution that comes along with it. Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ, and it is therefore not surprising that Christians should be called to suffer. In fact, it's a joy and a token of peace. What I really want you to understand at the heart of this is at the beginning of the kingdom of heaven, God is introducing the kingdom of heaven to all of you because he wants you to know it's for you. Maybe you're poor in spirit today. You say, I've got nothing to offer. And God says, perfect. This kingdom is for you. And you say, maybe, well, all I can do is cry. It's like I can't even, I can't do anything without mourning. My, I, I'm not good. My sin overwhelms me. And God says, fantastic. Your sin does overwhelm you. I'm so glad you can see that kingdom of heaven is for you. And you say, no, 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 I'm meek. I'm, I'm shy. I, I'm unassertive. Nobody's going to listen to what I have to say. And God says, that's fantastic. Listen to what I have to say. The kingdom of God is for you. And you say, I don't know. What, I just beat my chest all the time because I hunger and thirst for things to be right. And I, I, I've messed up so many relationships because I can't stand things not being exactly right. And God said, that's fantastic. The kingdom of heaven is for you and you will be satisfied. I will fatten you up because I'm going to please you more than you could ever imagine. You say, no, 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 you don't understand. I, I'm so merciful. I just give in to everybody. I'm the person that everybody walks over. I'm just, I never know when to say the right thing at the right time. And God says, no, 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 you don't understand. Like you can be run over your entire life if you want to be because the kingdom of heaven is offered to you. Because the kingdom of heaven is offered to you, you can endure every time the bus runs over you. 
And you say, wait, wait, I don't want to live a life like that. Wait a second. Maybe we do. Because I'm going to tell you, being merciful, well, first of all, you'll always receive the mercy you need. But being merciful is the only thing that really changes people's lives. People aren't usually, people are bent in anger, but they're molded in mercy. You say, well, that's not me. I'm not merciful at all. I got nothing to offer. And I say, pure in heart. Look, this is a difference in in personality right here. And I'm just going to express it between me and my wife. My wife is so much more merciful than me. She listens to every person and nods the whole time they talk. They can say the craziest things. And she'll just nod and be like, yeah, baby, I know it's crazy. Yeah. They'll be like, yeah, the the moon is in this thing here. And that's why my soap is green in in the bottom bathroom. And she'll be like, I know it. Soap changes all the time based on the moon. And she'll just nod with that person. If she nods at you, that doesn't mean anything, by the way. She's so merciful. She'll meet you right where you're at and everything. And me, I can't. Like, I'm so focused. I'm so pure in heart. That every three sentences you say, I'll say, let me just make sure I'm understanding. So this is where the pencil is, and these are the the things right here. You said soap. You know what? Let's get off of that because that doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm so narrow. I'm so straightforward. Like, I have to understand every step. So I just want to be clear. I want to be clear what I'm saying to you right now. The kingdom of God is offered to those who are merciful. And the kingdom of God is offered to those who are stubborn. Because of the kingdom of God, we both have something to offer. It all begins with knowing that we're not much. The pure, the poor in spirit. But it always goes to we all have something to give the kingdom because of the kingdom of God he can use whatever your ale is that was a word we used to use and just in case you don't understand my granddaddy my favorite phrase he used to make he said what ails you boy whatever ale you got God can use it I better be careful with that the more I say it the worse it sounds in my head Here's what the merciful need. They need to realize that mercy is coming. And here's what the pure in heart need to remember. It takes constant cleansing. I can be as driven as I want to be, but I still need salvation from God every day. In light of the kingdom, we can surrender everything in this world. Because the kingdom exists, we can surrender everything in this world. King Jesus reveals the kingdom living, reveals kingdom living. We can surrender this world. Everyone can reach it, and it can reach everyone. I want you to know today that if you feel like you've got nothing to offer Jesus, Jesus comes to you. And if you've walked in today thinking you've got a lot to offer Jesus, hey, the kingdom of God is yours. He loves you right where you're at. And so the the last piece I need you to understand is that this is a kingdom of blessing. It's not a kingdom of cursing. It's not even a kingdom of discipline, although we have made it that way. Us good fundamentalists sometimes, you know, we've made it a, 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 a kingdom of discipline. No. It's a kingdom of blessing. You've done nothing to deserve it. And yet it's offered to you today. Today, if you're in this house and you say, Webb, I need a blessing. I need Jesus. I need this kingdom to be realized. I want you to stand right where you're at. I want you to respond today. Would you do that? Thank you for joining the Askeville Assembly of God sermon podcast. For more information on our ministry, please visit our website at askevilleassembly.com.